Well, here we are. This is a, a huge episode, partly because I didn't record one for a while, but I've, also because I got Johnny Harris back. Johnny, thank you so much for joining me again. Excited to be here. This is, uh, it's great. I think this is our third podcast together over the years. So it feels good to it is. be like a, a return, like a return guest. It's like a status. Yeah, you're a wanted. fixture so of the show. Yeah, exactly. Well, and you're here for episode 100. <laughs> which some people were talking to me on Twitter, like, what are you going to do for episode 100? I'm like, I'm just going to get the best guest. And that's, that's about it. Um, but I mean, it, it is also pretty cool. I mean, you know, it's a nice round number, hundred episodes, yeah. but it's not like people have celebrate like a hundred YouTube videos or anything. That's not, that's not really a thing. It's more of a, maybe no. podcasters get more excited about it. Yeah, totally. Well, I'm happy to be here on episode 100. Well, if anybody doesn't know what Johnny does, which of, of course you all do, <laughs> he makes really fantastic videos just about the world like things that you've probably wondered about or may not have thought to wonder about but um like i mean first of all where, where you are since last time you came on the first time you came on you hadn't started your youtube channel yet um yeah. next time wow. you were further into it i, I think you had just kind of warmed up then last time was when you were in calgary mm -hmm. um, and you're kind of full steam ahead with it and now you're like mm -hmm taking off and it's amazing and it's like obviously become you know the the i, I think the most of what you're doing at the moment but yeah, uh, yeah it is it's been? the the it's the majority of what i focus on in terms of videos on youtube for so many years it was uh vox and it was making journalism um and and that ended uh i sort of uh borders usa was canceled which was my show uh that i had done it Vox and I sort of decided to not continue uh, exploring stuff at Vox and to start my own channel. And it's been that was a bit of a risk because, you know, when you when you work at a institution that has a lot of clout and a lot of notoriety, it's a lot easier to just sort of make stuff and be a part of this big output of information and, and videos and subscribers and all of that. Um, and so it was a bit of a risk, but uh, it's worked out really well so far. So that really is my full-time job now is making YouTube videos and then also growing our, our startup, uh, which is a like a course platform for same type of thing, smarter videos about the world and how to understand the world, but more geared towards like travel. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm so glad that, well, first of all, with your channel, I'm super glad that you started doing this sort of self-directed thing. Does it feel like you were able to be any more free in terms of the topics that you choose uh, or were, did you already kind of have the freedom to take it where you wanted before or like now is it is it a lot more open like did anything really change in terms of your subjects that you decide to tackle yeah totally it changed a lot um mainly because when you represent a journalistic institution there's certain norms and like reputation considerations that you have to keep in mind like you the rigor around fact checking and around like how you characterize stuff is so much more extreme because you're you know you're part of the press like you you have to get it right and you and you have to and you're representing an institution you're not just representing your personal voice and so while i did have a lot of creative freedom and i had a lot of editorial freedom there was that weight and responsibility which also has a big upside too uh that has gone away now that i'm on my own I pick topics like why I hate breakfast and, uh, you know, stuff like that. That's like a little bit more trivial and like maybe not worthy of like journalistic reporting, but it's <laughs> I don't know. still I fun. Go that far, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe not. Maybe not. Like I, I, I try to find rigor in, in every topic I cover, but like it's a little more ranty. I can get on a soapbox a little bit and sort of be more personal. And that's really fun, but it's also... I sort of miss having been surrounded by like journalists who like keep me really, really like push me to go deeper. I don't have that. I don't have any oversight right now, which is really fun, right. but I sort of miss it in some ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have those feelings often too of, uh, you know, what I was doing when I worked with a bigger team, wasn't producing media, but just having like-minded people surrounding you that have, I don't know, that'll tell you you're wrong or tell you your idea is dumb and then give you a new idea like that, that sort of feedback loop of more people can be really helpful. And uh, yeah, I mean, for anybody doing freelance, like it's obviously a totally different beast, but you know, I, I, so I don't know, I don't know, I don't know where to take this. I didn't set any uh, 
topics before this. I want to hit on the Sony A1 at some point, just talk a little bit about gear. Um, there isn't that much more gear I want to talk about. A lot of what I want to talk about is just like creating stuff lately because it's also been it's been a super weird year to be to be making it's, anything oh and my gosh so yeah. it's like it's also it's an interesting year for you to have kind of blown up like or you know i in my words let's say you blow, you've blown up in the last year but like all that growth in a time where like the backbone of what you are about was like traveling and being on the road and now it's like oh all of that kind of goes away and you've sort of really hit your stride and found your audience which is like an interest like yeah, actually, that a lot of people are discovering you, not thinking of you as the person that's on the road all the time. Yeah, I don't, it's I don't so know. weird. It's like it's like forging my identity in my office as like an animator, yeah. which is like not what I am. Like, <laughs> I use anim- I use animation to like help enhance my stories, like when I'm out on the ground, like interacting with the world and showing visuals uh, from my trips, and like that's the heart of like the journalism I I like to do, and so it is very strange that like. I've had to lean into these explainers, which luckily at Vox, before I ever did field explainers, like field documentaries, I I did do a lot of voiceover and animation. Like that was sort of the heart and soul of my like training as a visual storyteller. And so I, I'm sort of almost going back to that map explainers, uh, animated explainers with a lot of voiceover. It's very, very different than uh, what I eventually started to do uh, at, at Vox. But luckily, I'm, I'm fluent in it enough that, that I can do it. But when I start traveling again, I'm excited to introduce my audience to like, hey, guys, this is what I actually do. Like, I actually go out and <laughs> yeah. sort of like vlog yeah, yeah, explain. Yeah. And and like, this is like where I'm in my natural habitat. So it's been very strange. And I'm honestly so ready for it. I'm so ready. I, I feel like I'm scraping so much fodder visually from the Internet and from map data that I'm just like, let me just go point a camera at something. And in that, and in that case, you talk about gear, like gear, I've just been out of the gear game because I don't need it. Like it's, I yeah, just right. need a nice microphone and, and after effects like that. Those are my tools these days. Yeah. I mean, the, the gear thing has sort of been, um, you know, from the outside, like looking at people, what, what the interesting stories, a lot of them are in terms of the accessories as well. Like, obviously we've had great cameras come out, but the things that have made the big impact is that like there are so many great studio lights and like more live streaming options and mics and sort of like people's ability to do stuff like this has kind of been where I've seen people doubling down. Um, yeah. Things I've been thinking about lately. So like per- personally right now, I've been like in such a um, not so much like I'm not like down on, on, on the work that I'm doing, but I'm very, I, it's so hard for me to focus. I'm just like, I can't keep my mind on what I'm supposed to be doing. Probably cause I'm checking the news every 15 minutes. Um, yeah. but it's, it's been this, like we, the, the same effect that you're talking about of like, I'm used to creating things that are like pretty visual. Like that's kind of my theme. It's like tech, but also creating something visually interesting with it and then it's like it's winter here we're like going through a series of lockdowns and there's like there's not that much to point my camera at lately and so it's been this like you know trying to to find like what's worth talking about that is at home and uh like kind of under that is like in a super controlled environment um and what i've found i think part of the thing that's been hard for me about that is that It really means like talking in in my niche. It's like talking about tech at a really like technical level and just like kind of looking at the product and spending a lot lot of time focused on the product instead of focusing on what you can do with it, which was what was always a little more like exciting about videos Mm -hmm. when I was traveling more. Um, You know, we were lucky enough to we did travel in last summer, which things are, you know, have changed a bit. It's a little harder to travel at the moment. But like we were traveling at least that one time and got a few videos out about that. And it's like, hey, that looks a lot more interesting, like something there's something to look at. Yeah, right now it's like I don't love spending so much time sort of navel gazing about just the technology and not like, okay, what's something interesting? What does this do for you in your life? Um, Totally. So I don't know. I'm a little like jealous of your your structure because it's like you're talking about like broader topics that are always interesting. You know, like you can you can very much be anywhere. Other people that have success with explainers, like I'm thinking of like CGP Grey 
it doesn't even use photography right and yeah uh, yeah the ideas are inherently interesting um like the yeah, interest yeah. is you could just talk about it and it would all be there um totally so, i don't know i i, I, I really li like that about what you've been doing but yeah i appreciate that and luckily that is one of the fallbacks is like i have been able to find stories that i can tell from a very macro level i call it like the macro which is just the broad story like i literally just did one this week about china and like the rise of china it was like the broadest story you could ever imagine like all the way from like the 1600s to modern day china and it's just like that's what i'm leaning into it's it's interesting what i miss though is sort of exactly what you miss in terms of like the interesting stuff is like the micro, like what, how this applies to the real world, whether that's tech, mm -hmm. you know, for, for you, like for me, it's like how these issues affect people and actually like uh, affect how they're living. That's interesting to me. I was able to get a little taste of this, um, a video I made a while back on the country of Liberia, which just has this insane story that I, I don't want to spoil it, but uh, the... I was able to ask my friend, uh, Drew Binsky, he's another YouTuber, if he knew anyone in Liberia. And I got connected with this guy on the ground who I started like WhatsApping with. And I started to ask him to go like film stuff for me. I was like, oh, there's this one thing I need to see this building that's like really important to the story. Can you go film it? He's like sending in videos to me. And I was getting that buzz of like, oh, that's the real world out there. Like that's like that's the way it actually looks on the ground. And like <laughs> I've lost touch. I've lost touch with like going out. The and world still exists. Evidence. I can't believe it. Yes, yeah. exactly. And it's like that's that is the meat of these stories in my mind. And every Borders episode, everything like it's geared towards explaining how it actually looks on the ground instead of just that sort of macro map view, which is fun and useful and interesting. But like, oh, it doesn't it doesn't scratch the itch for me. So yeah, I'm I'm eager right. oh. to get out. This there. is making me come up. I'm coming up with a theory on the fly. So. Right now, the the biggest news by far has been the you know the Wall Street bets stuff and GameStop stocks potentially breaking down the stock market and and all that. And I was I was noticing on Twitter the other day I was like this story has actually taken over my Twitter feed more than any of the other crazy news stories that have happened in the last six months or so. Like they they obviously were big and I was seeing them a lot, but. Every, literally every single person had some kind of take on the stock market situation. And I was thinking that like, maybe the reason is because like most of the other stories, we, most of us that don't live in Washington, DC, like can't directly connect to our real lives. We can't go outside and see the results of a lot of these things, but the stock market thing, it's like when you open up your phone and look at the stocks app, you're actually having this like direct connection from like the crazy news stories in your timeline has some sort of like material connection to reality a little bit and that people are, I don't know, like it's, there's just this like super storm of how interested people in are this. Cause there's also money involved. There's, you know, meme, <laughs> meme drama, which people love. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. but that, yeah, it's, it's like, I, 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 I don't know. I just found that like people are going nuts for this story and that yes. uh, in, in a time yeah. of like everything else already being interesting, but. I, I think you're right. It's this perfect storm of so many elements that like makes it feel real and close to people as opposed to these other big forces that are like sort of hard to get your head around, especially COVID stuff where it's like you can look at data all day, all day long, but like our brains mm -hmm. are not wired to like really be able to comprehend data. We sort of pretend to and we like look at the charts and we're like, wow, that's a yeah. lot. You know, that's a big number. And like I rely mm -hmm. on data all the time. But like at the end of the day, people want a story and they want like they want to be able to envision like the outcome of something and think oh, about did, it in did you terms the, that they realize. The um, what, the what was rights. The, the, so, OK, so somebody pre-purchased a publisher pre-purchased the rights to a book about the GameStop story. <gasps> and then within the day, Warner Brothers, I think it was Warner Brothers somebody a studio had bought the rights to the movie of that book that was just optioned about the story so that, like within that's amazing and that, yeah and we're still in the middle of it like you can't write the book yeah. yet because it hasn't happened yet like this is I, all happening right now i literally said so i did a gamestop explainer this morning or i did it over the weekend honestly uh i put it up this morning which i don't really usually do but one of the takes that i didn't actually include in the video but i i said Man, this this is just such a perfect storm. I'm so excited to see to watch the movie about this in a year from now or something. 
because yeah. it just it just had all the trappings. So that's real. I didn't know about that about the books and the the rights to the story, but that's exactly right. Like it it feels it's this comeback story. It's like. 2008 is like still on our minds about how like these other people were ir- like were irresponsible with market manipulation and and they didn't pay any price and now we're sort of getting back at them. There's all these elements that are so enticing uh, for for a good story. So yeah, I think that's totally right. So something that you do well, like you strike a good balance of um, that I worry about. It. So if I were to cover topics that are like pretty broad like this. A lot of the time, my concern is is getting it wrong. Like I, do, I really don't want to put incorrect information out there. And so, you know, the fact that you have a journalism background makes you perfectly equipped to like be really rigorous in your research and be really confident about what you put out there. That, you know, maybe my my lack of that background makes me less confident about it. But um, because of that, I've sort of taken on less of the of the kind of big topics lately. And something that I think you've done well is keep a, I mean, keep you, keep it from feeling political, like feeling, keep yeah. it from feeling like you're being biased. Well, I don't know the way to frame this. I don't like the perspective that people have of like, you can't be biased. You can't have a perspective because like, you know, you're talking about this in one of your recent videos. We all have it. We all are coming from whatever perspective we already have. And we are going to, our bias will shine through. Um, but you are, are are doing it in a way where it's like it doesn't feel like you're pushing an agenda. You're more about just education, and I really like that angle. Um, but it's like it's a really fine line to walk. So it's like, you know, talk, talking about any of these current events, like you are so. It feels like you are taking a side so easily by even just having an argument about it. You know, like even like trying to understand the whole context of whatever is happening in a situation is like. I don't want to feel like I'm jumping on a side or representing information wrong. I don't know. Have you, how you kind of felt like that? This is this to me. I mean, I'm glad to hear you say that because that's a general almost mission of mine is to present information in a way that sort of weaves through and avoids the typical pitfalls of, of like polarization or like falling into a a very clear bias. Even, even though I have some of those biases, like, that I that I hold strong to personally in the stories, and I, there are some that I do lean into uh, and, and that I feel strongly about. But a lot of times, I really try to weave, and I say weave because it's almost like you're avoiding landmines. Like at, at any topic, mm-hmm. the language you use signals to the viewer where you stand. And so, I if you watch a lot of my videos, or if you were to read my scripts you'll see me take language. Like uh, I, I recently did one, how the US stole the Middle East. And and I changed the language to like make it feel like a, like a storybook almost. Like I'm just telling this person did this and then this person did this. And that really helps pull it out of the popular vernacular that you've heard about the news and that you've heard a lot of pundits and sort of were saturated in a certain vernacular I find that if you take the story out of that vernacular and you tell it in different terms, it's fresher and more interesting to listen to, but it also doesn't like trigger those same defensive political stances that like you take in a typical conversation because you're you're taking a, you're using different ingredients almost. And and so that's sort of a, a very in-depth sort of look in, into like the background background of like how I think about storytelling and with these sorts of issues, but like it's really a language thing. Like if you were, if you look at my videos with that lens, you'll see it left and right, how I just change words and like say it in very different terms just to avoid any of that pitfall. Well, do you feel like in the end, do you ever end up getting dragged into these arguments though? Because like, obviously anything, I mean, even talking about, you talk about the rise of China, like that is a topic that's, you know, likely to get somebody frustrated for one reason or another, based on how you represent some part of it. Do you, end up actually avoiding the landmines or do you still end up stepping on them sometimes i mean it's the youtube comment section there's no avoiding uh anything that that is <laughs> that is terrible yeah. and uh, you know that you want to avoid in terms of uh, uh fighting uh no i don't i but i would say by and large for the topics i cover i'm able to develop a consensus of appreciation for the information that overrides this sort of fight over uh, the details. And mm-hmm. 
and that consensus of information or that consensus of, of, of understanding is basically what I want viewers to feel. I want them to watch and I want them to get like excited about the fact that they now have access to this topic that like Wikipedia or the books or the newspapers don't give them access to. And like, I'm able to enlighten it in this way. And like, that's the goal. If, if the top comment is people being like, wow, thank you for making me interested in this thing. I didn't think I'd be interested in, like I've done my job. And so, no, I don't avoid it, but I definitely try to drown it out with, with uh, cultivating an appreciation for the information instead of just like right. fighting over it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it ends up building an audience where like most people that are subscribed to you are at least understanding like where you're coming from and what you're trying to do. And hopefully, although I guess I don't know, like maybe you might, uh, you know, like you've had growth with subscribers, but you might still end up with a lot of non subscribers commenting on every video like that. I think that might be the kind of traffic you're, you're still getting because it's like people are searching for, or they're getting recommended your videos. So you probably have a lot of non commenter or non subscriber comments currently, which I get like, yeah. as well. Like, tech has tons of like kind of drive by comments. Whereas, you know, say vloggers, it's like more of a tight knit community, but yeah, that's exactly right. And, and when a video goes big, I start to see that more drive by people who come yeah. in just to sort of nitpick. Uh, and <laughs> the only thing that really drags me in, like, usually I'm just like, whatever it's the comments and I have become like thick skinned at this point. Uh, like you sort of have to, if you're going to be on the platform, but, um, the one thing that I I actually like get ready to fight on is uh, typos. People people. <laughs> so I I, I yeah. am totally okay with typos. Like I I in, in most contexts. Like there's certain. Wait, wait, is this I'm your like, typos in the video or people's typos in yes. comments? No, this is this is, these are my typos in the video. Like I have this like ruthless and aggressive stance that's controversial among a lot of people that like. I'm here as a communicator. I'm not a grammarian. Like I'm going to make mistakes. Uh, and, and the fact is like, we're here to not nitpick those mistakes. We're, we're here to like understand the broader scope of the video. Uh, and so, but, but the internet is the exact opposite of that. The internet is a place where people love to correct little things. Like it's like, it's like mm -hmm. they've won the lottery that day. If they can find a mistake and call <laughs> it out in the public square, like that is like, every commenter's yeah. dream and so and nobody and realizes so, they're all calling out the same mistake yes and they're so excited and like they're all just like this is amazing like look um and so i that's that pushes my buttons that's where i i will go in and and get snarky and get sort of like like polemic which is like the dumbest most petty thing in the world but i sort of have this thing where where people are obsessed with it's it's kind of and this is maybe an interesting topic about gear uh maybe a segue into gear but like it kind of reminds me of the person who doesn't ever shoot anything like doesn't ever go out into the world and sh use their camera they spend time thinking Wait, about are you talking the... about me in 2020 because it sounds really familiar right now <laughs> sorry sorry. <laughs> sorry this is not yeah, yeah, yeah. this is I, not I get a jab. It, I, get it. I mean i i saw you at a, at a lodge in canada one time in a shoot i know you're you're a real deal <laughs> shooter so yeah. uh but this is like the the person who will uh talk to you all day about the rolling shutter or about um exposure and, or about depth of field but won't ever shoot anything and and they they see the tool as the end in and of itself instead of a means to like make beautiful images There's or a lot tell of them a story or whatever it yeah. is. Yes, and and the, the grammarians, the the pedants I call them, are that like the people who correct the language, but they're not actually like enjoying or or sort of like delighting in the fact that like language can be used for these beautiful means to like tell stories. And so I, anyway, I feel very strongly about this uh, for some strange reason, but it's the one thing that will drag me deep into the comments and I'll just How like get feel... snarky. How do you feel about sort of like new misuses of words? Cause like I've always tried to be kind of progressive about like, okay, language is changing. It's always, you know, the way that people use it is what words mean. I've been really frustrated lately with the young people's use of aesthetic and also that it yeah. seems to be switching a lot to aesthetic and <laughs> that like <laughs> just the conception of what the word is like it's almost it's usually used incorrectly now that's become like the more common use is like that thing is aesthetic meaning it is cool like meaning yeah. you know it's like it's like 
uh, referring to the the weather outside is like, yeah, that it's a lot of temperature outside. There's so much temperature yeah. going on. Yeah, yeah. So I, 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 I have two feelings about this, and they're almost they're <laughs> sort of put opposing. You on the spot. <laughs> no, no, this is good. This the, I actually have like deep sort of weird theories on this stuff. Um, so. I just finished creating a language learning course for for Bright Trip, which is our our course platform. Oh, perfect! And in in that process, uh, I am learning Italian. Like I, I, the course is me and Nathaniel Drew, uh, uh, like basically unveiling all of our tips about language learning. And in the process, I'm learning Italian. And the core sort of, and I promise this this relates to aesthetic. Like, uh, they're not core, just showing off. Yeah, exactly. I'm not just plugging my, my brighttrip.com slash language. <laughs> Which you should. Um, Everybody go check out Bright Trip because yeah, it's awesome. Totally. So, um, but as I, I, our, our sort of philosophy on language is like the only language that's worth learning if you're learning a foreign language, which is a really hard thing to do, is the language that you're actually going to use, like the way it actually works. Like language is not math. It's not like verb plus noun plus preposition. It's like language is this like deeply expressive very very primal old part of us as humans and it's a very unique part of humans and it's a beautiful part of our culture that we get to express ourselves in these whatever way we want in the same way that like clothing is you know and so on that in that sense if i if i put on that lens of like the hyper uh like let all language in if people can use it and it can be understood then I feel like let the kids say whatever they're going to say, no matter how wrong it is. And like if it becomes, if it takes on a meaning of itself and it starts to become a more detailed, useful meaning, then like let it be, even if it's totally different. You know, there's so many words that are different now uh, that mean things totally different now than they did in, in 1912, you know, and it's like mm -hmm. we use them today and it's and You it's just got to suck it up and deal with it. Yeah, it's just that, that's that's my one side. The other side is this... Uh, when I hear people using words in these deeply imprecise ways, such that like, like, oh, that word actually is so useful and so rich. And yet you're just lumping everything into it. Like mm -hmm. the word ironic mm -hmm. is, a, is a great example, like where people use it yeah. as like a coincidence, uh, like, oh, it's ironic that you're here because my sister's here too. Uh, like, like that's not ironic and ir ironic or irony is actually a deep, like beautiful literary concept. Uh, and so in that sense, I decry it because it's like, oh, you know, you're losing the beautiful meaning of these words uh, for these more reductionist meanings. So anyway, those are my two battling sort of paradigms on the on the change of language. Uh, and they're, they're sort of in opposition, but I don't know where I stand. No, I totally hear you. I have that like frustration of when because, yeah, it, but by turning one turning you know, three or four d different words that have clear defined meanings into one, you end up with less, a smaller vocabulary. Like there's just less ways yeah. to talk and communicate. And it's, yeah. I don't know. This is just part of becoming old. <laughs> I, I think, think I think sure, so. Sure and in fact, anytime, this, but. anytime I do the, the, the quote kids these days sort of vibes where I'm like, I'm like, oh man, it's just crazy. Like when I was, a, when I was a teenager, like blah, 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 blah. I already hear myself and I'm like, no, I will not become mm -hmm. that like cliche older, older you man can't help it. who like looks back. <laughs> I know I could, yeah. I could already feel it. So yeah. maybe I'll just lean into it. Yeah. Just start a, a, a pedant channel, uh, correcting your uh, commenters grammar. Um, yeah, exactly. let's, let's make sure we do touch on gear a little bit though. So I'll, I'll, I'll switch gears to gear. Um, what do you, uh, what have you been shooting on through the, uh, pandemic times um still i was holding out for the a7s3 i'm a sony guy have been since mm -hmm. 2017 um it's a good year for you yeah and then and then when the when it came out i bought it and and but sort of late like i, I stuck with my a7 three uh for up until just about a month ago honestly and then these two a7s threes came in and i am loving them in terms of the noticeable and even one of my editors was like did you shoot with like new lights or something like what this footage looks <laughs> so much better and i was just like nope like this is the new is that camera. what you're using right now no this is an old a7 III. so this is where the old the, the ones we used to use is now it's my webcam. webcam yeah exactly so 
but I've loved it uh, from a the user experience on the menus is like smoother. Uh, I love the big HDMI cord that comes out of it. Um, and then yeah, that 10 bit, you know, is like just presumably better footage. I haven't really graded it yet. Like I haven't been out. I've just done no color profile on anything. But I'm excited for the day when I can actually like lean into it and and sort of see what it does in the field because that's what really matters for me. Right. Were you shooting? Because when you were in the field before, you were shooting log before, right? I think you were. Yeah. For most stuff, I was shooting log. Yep. And then grading it afterwards, and and slightly dissatisfied with like having to overexpose all the time and like not really knowing. And that's not yeah. when I'm in the field. I'm thinking about story. I'm thinking about visual evidence. I'm thinking about interviews. I'm not monitoring. Uh, all the scopes and the things like I'm just letting it go. And so that was a big issue. And I'm hoping that this more flexible bit rate, uh, hopefully gives me a little bit more leeway and forgiveness in post. Yeah. Yeah. I I think you will find that. And also they've gotten better with like preview modes and it's all stuff that I'm looking forward to with the C70, which will hopefully be my next camera. If it ever comes in, no cameras are easy to get a hold of this year, but I'm still waiting on it. But it has like false color and like just easier ex- exposure stuff and like the uh, LUTs that you can preview in are more accurate. And um, I think every camera has gotten better with that stuff lately. Um, yeah. Big new one. I got to touch on it. I don't have a lot to say about it, but I do want to touch on the A1 because like it looks like we ha- the last episode of the podcast was the gear of the year 2020. And so... We were choosing like, hey, what's the best uh, hybrid camera right now? And we decided on the Canon R5. This was just the last episode. Now, since then, it looks like it's got to be the Sony A1. I mean, this looks like the just camera that's going to dominate everything. Like if you want the best camera, this is the like, let's hold nothing back, put every single feature in there. And Sony just totally did it. Like this has everything and it's amazing. And my main take on it, because, you know, I've, I haven't watched that many reviews. Like, I haven't used it, obviously. So my main take is that a lot of the comments at first were about the price, which I, I think, if anybody can confirm, I think it was like 6800 US. Um, yeah. You know, that's quite a bit. But, uh, no, 6500 because then I checked. And the what we have to keep in mind is that, like, pro bodies, I was looking at the Canon 1DX, uh, when it was first released, was 6800 So it was more. And... Hmm. This is what it costs for like the highest end professional body when it's brand new. Like there should always be a market for like, look, we gave you everything, every single feature yeah. you could hope for. It's all in here, but you got to pay more yeah. for it. And like, it's still under 10,000. Like this is not an unreasonable price just because it's in a smaller body. You still got all those features. So I don't know. I just, I can't be I, offended by it. Yes. Six, six yeah, I, I agree. And especially because there is a there is a tiered system now of like the a seven S three is that still high end for maybe a prosumer or whatever, but like not, Mm -hmm. it's, it's not break the bank. It's not the 6,000 range. And then you have obviously tons of options in the lower sort of under 2000 range, it seems. So it's like, I love that they're, they're giving like that. That's an option. I think that's amazing. My big concern has been sort of the concern uh, I've always had with these big launches. I remember, I think in the past, like, and I don't remember the specific models. I think it might've been like the Sony A9 or something, or like even the AR3, which is a great camera. Like they were at a higher price point. I sort of looked at them and I was like, these are the, these cameras have it all. But then I realized that they have it all for like a certain person and like, not for me. And that's what, when I see this, I think like, okay, on paper, it has it all seemingly, but it's like, will this actually be the right camera for me when I'm out in the field? Um, and I don't know until I use it and that's, or I don't know until I really see people using it in the, in the context that I would be using it because on paper, that's not enough for me. Like I need to actually see how it, how it does and how it performs, what the footage looks like, all of that, because the specs aren't, aren't enough to, to signal that to me, but certainly it looks very promising and, uh, it's awesome that it's so small. Yeah. And the one, uh, okay, what I would fault this camera for is actually kind of classic Sony. And it's more about the actual design of the camera, like the, the, the usability when other brands like, you know, Canon 1DX have done their flagship camera that costs more than everything else. Like you're, you're paying a premium because this is the newest tech crammed into a smaller body. And like, you're paying for the fact that this, they're going to sell less units. Cause this is, you know, 
there's all these reasons that this camera is more expensive the what everyone else has done has redesigned the body so that at a glance you're like oh that's the expensive one i can just tell by looking at it like that obviously mm -hmm. should and would cost more because it's bigger <laughs> is often part of how you mm -hmm. indicate that um the controls are a little different maybe there's more buttons that are accessible on the outside like all these things that visually signal to a consumer like this is the one that you want to spend more money on but since the yeah. a1 looks almost identical to the whole a7 series like to everything else people are relatively superficial and have a hard time grasping like oh you know <laughs> it may look the same but it actually does something different and so i think that's a big misstep by sony and a lot of the reason people feel like maybe it's not worth the price that they're putting on it um, which is yeah, so that's funny it's I like it's the same for, but... it's like it's so funny that like <laughs> because of the way it looks and feels we're like oh this can't this can't possibly be that much better it can't be than... worth more yeah. yeah because look at it i mean just look at it and it's like well do you know that camera it happens on the inside why, why it's better you know it's like not it's not what the, the chassis is you know and so but that is a funny sort of study in human psychology around like we need it to have slightly different knobs and be slightly beefier to the hand when you hold it so you can like feel like okay this is worth double the price like look feel how beefy it is like that's such a just a primal psychological need we have that has nothing to do with like rational like oh it's actually a better camera on the inside yeah no but it, but it it's it's like it's dumb but it's also like you got, they they have to notice this they've been designing products for how old is sony 50 yeah. years like they got to be aware of this yeah. by now they've done it before i don't know it just seems like a, yeah. a bit of a misstep but um totally but yeah i mean feature wise yeah. obviously like kind of got to see more uh another thought i mean something i noticed in the comments here was about that it uh you know it's more expensive than say the c7 or the red komodo which is, is true but it also is an amazing stills camera which those aren't at all you know it also is 50 megapixels which like i'm on the record is like i don't care about megapixels but this is the top of the line camera it should have the sensor that the best sensor out there so um you know like that's why this is the best hybrid camera um and something i noticed in in some of the responses on twitter as well like people saying like but who is this camera really for because who needs both that like amazing stills quality and video quality in one body there's a lot of people that travel and shoot photo and video now. Like it is such a reality of the modern world yeah. and anybody that's pretending that category doesn't exist is crazy. And actually that reminds me of a tangent that I wanted to rant about. Like I almost, I've been wanting to make a full video about, but I can't, I can't think of like 10 minutes worth to say. So I'll just say my one minute, one minute <laughs> worth here is that um, I, every iPhone video I get, I talk about professionals using iPhones, especially for like that every photographer I know all of them use an iPhone. There's no high-end creators and also filmmakers. But none of my friends, which have quite a few that do like, you know, visual production work, they all use iPhones. Like it's just ubiquitous. And that I often say, you know, it's, it's, it's what professionals choose to use most of the time. Obviously there are creators out there that use Androids. It's like, it's a given. I'm just saying people in, in my circles. Um, but the response is so often like yeah but no professionals use phones to create professional work they're always using their real bigger cameras so like what does it even matter um that is just so 100 percent true and i just wanted to or untrue and i just wanted to point out that this week like we were just doing a job where we shot a bunch of stills no we did it twice we did it last month as well i think i talked about it on the podcast last time too but that like high end big commercial clients like and one of them the one that we just did this week is like a huge brand they are a major national international clothing brand and the request was specifically okay photos we shot on the real camera videos were all on iphone like they had or it could have been on any phone they didn't request which phone but like obviously i prefer iphone um and like it had to be on a phone and this has happened twice wow. now in two months and it's like wow. this is not this just is the reality of production right now. And so many people are confused about it. And also this one was a vertical video because it's for social. Brands are so much of their visibility is social media right now. And there's so many sort of gear snobs. And I think it's the people you were talking about earlier that are like, you know, using, they're more excited about the gear as an end as opposed to what they're making in the end um, that are like, well, you know, but it's not 50 megapixels. It's not a hundred megapixels. It's not 8K. And it's like that, what, what the visibility for most people trying to communicate, which is like individuals or companies, the way they reach their audience right now, so much of it is online. Like 
they're they might primarily be accessing their uh, customer base or community through TikTok or through Instagram or through Twitter yeah. or YouTube. Yeah. Like that might be yeah. the, the biggest access point. And to pretend that like, oh, so you shouldn't produce the best possible work for those mediums, like is just crazy to me. It's so yeah. short sighted that people still aren't taking that stuff seriously. Anyway, yeah, that's my I, I totally. And, and I that's that is indicative of my a transition that's happened for me just in the past two years, I used to sort of scoff at the idea of iPhone footage and just be like, this is effectively worthless. Like this is like great for my family videos or something, but like nothing else. But I, especially with the new lenses and like the flexibility with that, like I now have started shooting a significant amount of probably for the past year and a half of my like, when, when I'm sort of in a quick vlog situation, like I do it on my phone and it works and it totally works. And it, yeah, it's not like the same, it doesn't have the same uh, luster of a you know beautiful A7S or whatever, but like it works for what I need it to. And that's a really exciting threshold to pass because it means that I have like a really good camera with me. It's like the promise. I feel like it was the, it's the promise of what uh, I, phone cameras were, were like was back when it, started the the that promise but it really wasn't until just recently where it actually crossed the threshold where it's like this is usable and it's actually good like if you look at borders india which is the last uh borders uh season that published that's it you know high level like we borders gets nominated for emmys like it's like a thing that is professional and yet a lot of that i shot on the fly on my iphone and that's just the reality. And then, yeah, of course, the social media component of it. So uh, I think I think you're absolutely right that that is that is there's this resistance to it among gear people. But it's more and more becoming you know, the reality. Well, you know, how you can have like software that looks at your whole image collection. Like you could do this in Lightroom, for example, where you'd be like, OK, show me how many photos did I shoot on this camera or with this lens? Like you could sort by metadata. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see that for the whole Internet and views per piece of media, right? Like mm -hmm. how, you know, which was the most viewed video period in the world this month or whatever. I bet if you could sort all the media like that, you would see phones being the most viewed media, you know, more course, than any yeah. like professional high end cameras, like more than mo any movies being made, all being shot on Alexa's more videos are being seen that are shot on whatever the current most popular yeah. phones are. Which which um, back so. to my like big vernacular rant earlier, like the language that is being spoken is the language. Like that 100%. is the definition yeah. of the language. That the language That's of such a video good yeah, is yeah, good phones. Yeah, it's like the yeah. exact same thing. So it's like lean into what's happening instead of like having a chip on your shoulder that it's like not the best or like lamenting the the destruction of beautiful visuals because everyone's shooting on their phone. It's like, that's awesome. That's an awesome reality. Yeah. If there's any big filmmakers that are ignoring the internet, like they're going to fall by the wayside. Like it's part of our storytelling, like things like, I remember how sort of shocking it was to me the first time I watched David Dobrik videos. Cause I, you know, I did, wasn't watching them as he got bigger and I kind of found them when it's like, oh, these are the videos that get 10 million views right now. The editing in those is insane. Like it does not make sense. There's no continuity. Yeah. It's like, okay, we're here in a new scene. Something just happens with a series of quick cuts. Everybody laughs. And then you cut to a new <laughs> other moment in time in a new location with a different cast of people that you haven't introduced. Everybody laughs and then you yeah. cut away. Like that format is so manic. And, and, and really interesting, like to just say it's bad is just so completely ignorant. It's like me saying that teenagers misusing aesthetic is, is bad because um, it's, it's working yeah. like it, it is really hitting home with that younger audience in the same way that punk rock in the 70s sounded really new. And, and like it. Yeah, it was bad music, but it that was why it worked. And it yeah. became so much a part of our culture and it's like people that at this moment are like well it's it's bad and it's sloppy so we can disregard it and like it's not it doesn't count as is real media uh, just will, will not understand that this is going to be 
a, a like just completely embedded into our vocabulary in the future. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, so. yeah. I feel like that's a, a theme that uh, we're we're hitting on here. Yeah, a bunch. yeah totally. like, We we found like, a theme without setting one at the beginning. Yes, yes. Which is that we are we are getting old and starting to feel the impulses to decry the youth, and yet, and in fact, this has been happening a lot lately with tiktok i've like recently gotten on tiktok and like let the algorithm wash over my world to like start feeding me videos and it is crazy to be like this is what this this is the new generation of like creators that i'm now starting to see on a huge scale and like i feel this aversion to some of it but i'm like cool i can feel the aversion all i want and i'll be like a bitter old man but like this is <laughs> yeah. this is the way things are going yeah, yeah. i better just recognize it and like accept it okay perfect example of that are you are you on tiktok yet yet i know like of course you will but i i am actually planning on it at some point but i'm not no. is my, my wife mean, just started you are so like your content is so like in the uh perfect niche of like yeah this could go like you know, 30 second explainer videos, basically like yeah. take one of the facts that's from your video and, and just TikTok eyes it. Uh, I mean, like it could be crazy, but like, yeah. I've, I've had a really hard time with that. I think I did talk about this on the last episode that like, uh, Anya's channel, she posted a few TikToks lately that like just totally blew up as a surprise, like 300,000 views on a wow. no follower account. And we're just like, to pretend to keep pretending that TikTok's not here and like the platform of the year is really ignorant and just just like me trying to get out of learning something new. I'm still not doing yeah, it, so I'm still being lazy it, about it. Yeah, I'm I I'm in the same boat where I'm resistant only because I'm like I, well I don't want to learn these new like there's a whole new cadence so and hard. there's all these there's like a new culture to it. But I thought like okay well what's my what is the version of my videos? What's the value I add to the world with my videos and how could I distill that? And certainly you're exactly right. And I've come to the same conclusion. I could distill all of my videos into one big takeaway that's 30 or 60 yeah. seconds. And like that would add value to a whole nother platform. And that's like a pretty easy lift, you know, like I could totally make yeah. that happen. So that that is on and the horizon for with, me, I think, in the next with, month. You'd be talking to people you want to. It's like, it's not like you don't want to reach them because they're a younger audience. Yeah. Like, of course, we still want to talk to those people and be involved with like the, the fact that, you know, maybe they're spending more time over there rather than in YouTube, um, which actually, okay, this reminds me of something else I want to hit is uh, Clubhouse, which... Uh, you're not on yet, so I'll just rant to you about my perspective. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's like it's so happening right now that I feel like I've got to touch on it a little bit right now because we're on a we're on a podcast. We're doing a podcast live, so this is like kind of the uh, you know more uh, official professional version of what Clubhouse does. <laughs> but it's really having it. It's going to take off quickly. Like it will it will matter a lot in 2021. Um, so, you know, you hear, heard it here first right now it's invite only it's iPhone only. Um, so it's not fully mainstream. And actually I really saw the limitations of it last night. Uh, Elon Musk did his first, uh, well, Elon Musk got on it, which everybody freaked out over. Cause it's like, oh yeah, he's going to do something live. Of course he'll put his foot in his mouth and it's going to be hilarious. And I actually haven't followed up to see what happened. I tried to join it and you can only have 5,000 people in a room at a time. So like, you know, wow. They'd be like this stream being limited to 5,000 people, which is like just kind of weird that, yeah, I, mean, I don't wow, know, it's just streaming crazy. audio. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, th but I think there's this obsession, it, it's just to, just on that point, because yeah, I think it's yeah, really yeah. interesting as we talk about Clubhouse, there's in a world of like no friction to live streaming and to connecting, and especially this year, um, I worked on the end of year report for Google uh, for their trends for YouTube and did a bunch of explainers. And, and one of the big explainers that I made was about the rise of like all these different new live formats because of COVID. And I almost think that there's now this backlash to say like, like make exclusivity cool again, because inclusivity and freedom of access is so widespread. You can have access, you know, right. to your career, like through these live streams and whatever. And, uh, it almost seems like Clubhouse is a symbol of like uh, exclusivity being cool again, where it's like oh, in this day and age of everything being so accessible, totally. look at this thing that only 5,000 people can get in on, even though there's no technological limitation, there's no rational, it's purely like a psychological pull 
which I think is really an interesting reaction to to yeah. the media we've seen. And it'll come around, like, just to be clear, like, this will be on Android soon, and they're going to open up those, like, not because I'm talking to them, because I know how these things work, you know, Instagram, yeah. and I, was Twitter iPhone only as well? Like, Instagram was iPhone only anyway, and, like, mm -hmm. Facebook was invite only, and you had to be in a college, and, like, you know, these, all That's these right. platforms have gone through this phase, so this, yeah. the path of this is to open up, because they have investors, and they want to make a ton of money. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, eventually everybody will be able to join, but, like, um, you're totally right about the that like hype train and it's part of like why I wanted to get in there at first too I'm like oh I know that like a lot of VCs are in there and it's like a closed community and like oh that sounds exciting anyway I want to give my hot take on it before we kind of run out of time I know you have a heart out so we're, we're gonna have to wrap kind of soon but my take on it compare clubhouse is going to end up taking away from the time people spend listening to podcasts so like it's sort of like a direct comp petition to this show for example or anybody that does pre-recorded stuff or or live streams or whatever um first of all it is ex it's exciting like i am launching the app at least once a day and just kind of looking at it and there are very interesting conversations happening in it and i think the best of it is when people that never would want to start a podcast or you know kind of cr build a show are able to jump into a conversation and have the benefits of my favorite parts of a podcast with guests is like, it's just an excuse to have a good conversation. Like, you know, yeah. we, we've texted a few times in the last few months, but you and I haven't had an excuse to talk this much about anything. So it gives you that yeah. excuse. That is awesome. There is, I have absolutely, I'm like fully in support of that as a entertain, not entertain. I don't want to just call it entertainment, like a uh, infotainment medium as a, as a type of media that you just ingest, you just absorb. Um, big problem. A lot of the rooms have way too many people in them. Uh, you know, if, if you notice, this show never has more than three guests. Uh, most big shows don't have more than like four or five is a lot. But rooms on Clubhouse are like 15 people, 30 people all talking. Wow. You, don't, you don't know who they are. Like you can't start to identify with any of the guests. There's sort of not, no unifying factor and also not much of a filter in terms of quality of ability to contribute to the current conversation, right? So, um, you know, it is it is great that everybody can have the potential of having a voice, but as an audience member, I am I want to listen to, you know, Johnny Harris's podcast because, like, I like his perspective and I, I know what he, I know what to expect that he's going to have this certain bar of uh, the, the truthfulness of the information he's going to present to me, the entertainment value that is going to be there. Like I know his backstory a little bit. There's all these reasons you come back to a show and in clubhouse, you, you might only know one or two people in the room and then a bunch of other dipshits are going to join in that maybe don't have so much value to add and really enjoy talking and can totally dominate the conversation and steer it yeah. into the ditch like which yeah. is the same yeah. complaint i have about a lot of like live events and actually like live you know we're doing that we're recording this live um and a lot of live stuff will be heavily focused on the the, the chat which is like awesome for the conversation back and forth but as the listener later I don't love listening to like shows that record in front of a live audience and they let the audience stand up and ask questions because usually the questions aren't as yeah. I, I came to listen to what those hosts had to tell me. Like I came because of their perspectives yeah. and often the questions can just sort of totally divert into rat holes. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I, I, don't know. I agree with that. The, 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 no, that, that, that makes a lot of sense in terms of like the reliability of a podcast, especially a podcast, which is a pretty immersive, not even immersive, but like it's a big commitment. Usually it's 30 to 45 minutes for an episode. You're committing to a good amount of time. Uh, there's no visual, so you can obviously do it while you're like driving or whatever. But um, I do think that at least for me, I, I go to podcasts only when I know that like there's some reliability of like what I'm going to get if I'm going to sort of commit to 30 minutes of time ingesting. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think the draw would be if there's like someone I'm a big fan of or something, I would be interested to hear that person talk in any room about anything, even if there's 15 other people. Like, I think that, I think if there's anything that could drive this sort of laissez-faire Wild West version of live streaming and podcasting, like it's going to be the fan draw and it's going to be the, whoa, Elon Musk is talking, like everyone rushed to that. Yeah. Uh, you know, like 
as opposed to the more produced reliability aspect of it. Um, but yeah, I'm really curious to see what this riff on the format looks like and feels like uh, going yeah, forward. I mean, definitely I check checked it, it out. out yet. Yeah, yeah. I, I could complain about it all day long, but it's um, it's a th- it, same as TikTok. I have a lot to complain about on TikTok, but it's here <laughs> and it's going to stick around. So uh, you know, I need to understand it. I, I can't just pretend it's not there. Yeah, the, um, uh, just two two grouchy old men just complaining about all the kids these days and trying that's to the not definition feel... of a podcast. Yeah, that's 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 what we're doing. Anyway, yeah, exactly. But yeah, no, I'm super glad we could connect again, Johnny. It's uh, it's great to see your face, chat with you a little while, and uh, you know, do a podcast. And um, yes, indeed, there's, there's been a lot of them. And um, yeah, like just one more time, I'm so happy to see you. Just totally like find a way that you can super thrive this year it's been awesome to see you just take off yeah thank you it's been a really fun year and uh yeah i'm excited to keep keep building and and to see what the next step holds once i can actually take my camera to faraway places and (laughs) do what i like to do but i'm trying not to even think about that yeah any day now not really so anyway good to see you though i'm glad we got to connect and uh yeah i'm excited for the next time we get to do this again Absolutely. You'll be back. Thanks, man. Okay. Awesome. Have a good day.